Imagine the, uh, the Bible not as a dogma that you have to believe in order to go to heaven, but more like a ship's log uh, or a, a family journal that is handed down from generation to generation as a record of progress, uh, struggles, triumphs, setbacks, resurrections, um, and through it all, a record of our growth in wisdom. Imagine the Bible that way. Um, our ancestors journeyed over thousands of years, um, always yearning toward the promised land, the, the realm of God on earth, where people be, will be one with God and with one another um, and the earth, uh, living with compassion and justice and loving kindness for all. So think of the Bible as the voices of people who went through pandemics and social upheavals and natural disasters, um, times when they had to take in refugees and other times when they were the refugees, times when chaos or war or oppression descended upon them, and times when health returned, when peace came, when they had a, a sufficiency, when their gardens and orchards bore abundantly and, and were beautiful to behold, in times when their sanctuaries were full again. These were people like us, and they thought of us just as we think of generations to come. And they wanted us to know what got them through and what they learned. Over the years, people have added to the Bible their own music and poems and art and, and new spiritual teachings. We have today a wealth of comfort, guidance, and encouragement from the Spirit speaking through millennia of human hearts. So let us worship together full of uh, gratitude for all the gifts that can help lead us through our own stretch of the journey toward the promised land. three readings uh, this morning. The first is from Psalm 130, verses 1, 2, and 5 through 7. Out of the depths I cry to you, O God. 
please hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. I wait for you, my soul waits, and in your word I hope. My soul waits for God more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in God, for with our God there is steadfast love and great power to redeem. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, and 5, 16 and 17. We do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For well, what can be seen and what cannot be seen, what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. So we are always confident, for we walk by faith, not by sight. From now, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once were Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. The third reading is from Mark chapter three, verses 20 through 35. The crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For well, people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Belzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he cast out demons. And he called them to him and he spoke to them in parable. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself, and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end will come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him the crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. And here ends the reading.
So we face challenges, changes, and struggles in our lives as individuals, as a church, as a nation, as a planet. Changes seem to be coming faster, and the stakes in our struggles seem higher. But we are not the first to face such challenges. And we are blessed that our ancestors have left us gifts to help us find our way through loss or feeling lost so that we can emerge into the promised land of something more like God's realm on earth. Today's song uh, says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O God. That cry has been echoed in music and literature for 3,000 years. And when it was written, it itself was echoing a cry from the dawn of human consciousness. Out of the depths, out of our depths, we cry eternally. But at the end of that same song, just a few verses later, we hear a beautiful response, and it is equally eternal. And we know it is true, because without the, this fact, without the fact of it, we would not exist. It says, hope in God. For with our God, there is steadfast love and great power to redeem. Our ancestors experienced the spirit that flows through all of the universe and all time, that flows through our own hearts, and they recognized it as a source and a force of love and redemption. The, early, uh, the earliest followers of Jesus were Jews who worshipped on Saturday, but they extended their worship into Sunday. They called it the Lord's Day um, because it was the day of resurrection. That's why, because it was Easter. It was a celebration of Easter. And they were celebrating the recurring, the recurring triumph of love and redemption, moving ever closer to the sacred way of the Holy Spirit. The letters of the Apostle Paul cry out of the depths. If you read them all, they just cry out of the depths of prison, floggings, church conflicts, even the depths of the ocean in shipwrecks. The Corinthian church was a particular source of anguish to him. Uh, the main street of Corinth, uh, which, was a, was a, which was a crossroads of the Greco-Roman uh, world, uh, the main street of Corinth was lined with wine shops. Archaeologists have dug down and found all the, you know, just wine shop after wine shop. The high hill over the city was the site of a temple to Aphrodite, who was the main uh, god of the, of the city. And historians say that that, that temple was served by a thousand sacred prostitutes. The city of Corinth was a center of decadence and commercial trade and also cosmopolitan intellectual culture. Uh, considered itself very sophisticated. So the church that Paul founded there served like a spiritual 12-step group offering a way out of self-destructive material addictions. But in his letters, you can see that the, the selfish pursuit of privilege and pleasure came into the church and, and kept uh, corrupting the egalitarian golden rule of compassionate love that Paul taught and emphasized again and again. He wrote letters of tears, of rebuke, of frustration, calling the Corinthians back to the way of love, back to the spiritual dimension that permeates everything in the material realm, the unseen that lives within the seen. So he wrote in today's passage, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. 
Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. So we are always confident, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, this sounds dualistic, uh, but we do not have to choose between the spiritual and material realms. That is a misunderstanding that has plagued uh, theology and, and Christianity and the world uh, for a long time, but that's not what it means. Um, our bodies are, are, are temples, Paul taught. We do not have to reject the the flesh. We do not have to choose between spirit and material realms. What we need to do in order to sanctify the material realm is focus on the spirit, focus our entire lives on, on the spirit. And, and then once we are in that spirit that is in Christ, as Paul says, in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And that transformation is through our perception of the spirit through the material. This spiritual focus is the golden thread that we follow, that leads through the chaotic wilderness of challenges, changes, and struggles uh, to the promised land of a new creation, a new way of being. Today's gospel story shows how this thread led Jesus to find a new way to structure our lives and society to fulfill what the spirit of the universe longs to create on earth out of life. But imagine, imagine what it was like for Jesus' mother and, and, the, and the siblings that he grew up with to arrive essentially at the church door where he was in in the process of preaching and attempt an intervention on the grounds that he was insane. Essentially, they wanted to institutionalize him by pulling him back into the institution of the family. They wanted to restrain him. Imagine that. Can you imagine that? Imagine the pain of a mother so terrified by what could happen to her son and then hurt by his refusal to conform. Imagine if it was your own child. And then imagine the pain of the son to see that the people who knew and loved him best not only did not support his life work, but thought that the voice of the spirit that he heard was a delusion of madness. And then things got worse. Representatives of the governing religious and political authorities, the scribes, uh, learned about Jesus and came and they accused him of being satanic. Not just crazy, but satanic. This was an extremely dangerous situation. Jesus could be declared, at, at, at the very least, an impure outcast. Or he could be imprisoned or he could be executed. His family saw this coming, and that was why, part of the, probably why they were trying to restrain him. Because you were nobody, or you were worse than nobody, if you no longer identified with your family and your Jewish culture. Yet Jesus insisted, he insisted, that he was not positioning himself outside but at the true center of family and society. He insisted that the inside was what needed to change. He called people to stop blaspheming the Holy Spirit and start following it, no matter how foolish it looked, no matter how revolutionary, how much change it brought. He called them to stop identifying themselves by pride of family or nation and instead identify as one thing only, as doers of the word of God, as, as people living within the flow of the spirit of love and redemption. That is the family. That is our family. And that's where we find the true oneness, because that oneness 
of, of beings who are in the flow of the Spirit is completely universal. There is nothing outside our family or our community. Jesus was making this huge change in his life, in risky change, and he was asking his followers and family and, and society to change. He's calling us to change now and allow ourselves to be spirit-led, to dare to be different from what our culture is and what we have been. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O oh God. Imagine Mary praying that at night, so worried about her son. Imagine Jesus praying it up on the mountain, exhausted by his ministry, with his loving, wide open heart, wounded by the conflicts and the attacks springing up around him. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O oh God. We may be praying that ourselves because of the challenges and changes and struggles that we face. We have lost much, and we could easily feel lost in a world turned strange. And yet we also hear the answer to our cry, hope, hope in God. For with our God, there is steadfast love. That's what God is, that's what God does and great power to redeem. So we do not lose heart, for we walk by faith and not by sight. If we follow the Spirit of Christ, we can rest assured that we will find our way through the wilderness and reach the promised land. A new creation is coming to birth. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. We need to walk. We need to walk in that faith. So let us pray in silence, asking the Holy Spirit for the courage that our challenges, changes, and struggles require, and for the faith that we need to follow the Spirit wherever it may lead. Let us pray in silence. Amen.
version of the Lord's Prayer, which we will also screen share. Let us pray. You may be, you may be seated. <laughs> Let us pray. Our Father, Our Father Lord, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Against us. 